Hello, I want to show you how I made that. It all started with this cardboard finger I made in middle school. Uh, when you pull one string, it closes, and when you pull the other, it opens back up again. It's simple, but the motion is really very satisfying, almost organic. Well, naturally, I tried making a hand. Uh, the dimensions are based on my own. And again, it's not that bad. Uh, but the cardboard just wasn't sturdy enough, so I transitioned to wood. The fingers start with these templates, which I then glued to this square rod. Then I cut along the lines from each side using a scroll saw. This forms the hinges of the finger joints. So I've started to get interested in the history of mechanisms like this that try to imitate life. They're called automata, and it turns out that in the Enlightenment, so the 1700s in Europe, when people were trying to understand how animals and people actually worked, automata were viewed as proof that life is just a very complex mechanism. As I feed the strings through these holes in the joints, I can't help but feel parallels to a description I found in Descartes' treatise on man. He relates our ability to sense at our extremities as if by pulling on one end of a cord, you ring a bell which hangs at the other end. It turns out this comparison went farther though. Political thinkers like Thomas Hobbes describe not just humans, but even the state as an automaton. I'm fascinated by how what we make influences how we think. Well now I needed to actuate the finger somehow. I played around with a lever mechanism, like in this prototype, uh, but ultimately, I went with pulleys on the ends of motors. I turned the pulleys on a lathe, and really they're double pulleys, so that as one string winds up, the other unwinds. This way, by turning the pulley one way, it causes the finger to close, by turning it the other way, it causes it to open. To control the motor then, all I needed was some way to flip the voltage, because that would reverse the motor. By wiring two of these double throw switches like this, I could turn the voltage on in one direction pressing one switch, and reverse it pressing the other switch. Using a pinwheel with these cams, I can automatically turn the voltage on and flip it. A control mechanism like this is the heart, or rather brain, of most automata. It's similar to a music box, and automata in the Middle Ages often adorned automated organs and clock bells, though those were purely mechanical, whereas this is electromechanical. This way, just by rotating this, I can cause the finger to move. With a gang of ten switches, I can control all five fingers. Now all I needed was a bigger pinwheel to control all five switches. As I got more into the history of automata, I found some really interesting stories. The most famous automata maker in the Enlightenment was this French guy, Jacques Vaucasson. He made this flutist and drummer, as well as this duck which people went wild about because, and I'm honestly not making this up, it appeared to eat and then defecate. In the 1740s, Bugazan went to reform the silk industry in Lyon. His solution was an automatic loom, which was essentially just the pinwheel mechanism he had used in his automata, similar to the one I'm making, bolted to the top of a loom. You can still see this machine in a museum in Paris. This caused one of the first revolts against industrialization, but also influenced Joseph Marie Jacquard when he later tried automating the loom. Jacquard's punch card system inspired Babbage, known as the father of the computer, in the 1800s, who inspired Herman Hollerith and led to IBM and the first real computers. And this connection between automata and computers shows in the mechanism. By inserting these pins, it's like I'm writing data and storing it which the automaton then reads. Because these pins are removable, I can reprogram the automaton, basically write a new code for it. I'll show you.
I was so taken with this idea that automata influenced computers that I tried actually programming the hand with a computer. So I've got one, a little Arduino here, connected to some transistors on this breadboard, and it goes through these cable looms uh, to the motors on the hand. Uh, and the computer allows more flexibility in terms of timing uh, and precision of controlling the hand. But I'll show you in the code how in some ways it's very similar to the pinwheel mechanism. This is the code for the Arduino. Uh, here I'm defining the fingers. Um, but you know, just as the pinwheel mechanism rotates and loops around, so does the code. Here is the central uh, virtual loop. And within it, there's these highs and lows. These are just like putting a pin into one of these holes or not. Finally, I made this dial, which isolates and switches between the pinwheel mechanism and the computer. Now all I needed was some cabinet to put this all in. Putting this mechanism in a case is not insignificant. I think it's critical to making the machine evocative. Hiding the inner workings provides this mystery which forces the audience to imagine how it might work or what it might do. On top of this, it hides the nature of the device, causing us to question if it is good or evil. In the end, it's the viewer which gives the automaton life, and the case frames what kind of life that is. I found this cabinet at a thrift store. I like these engaged columns or plasters. They remind me of some of the first physical automata, made by Hero of Alexandria. His creations evoked temple architecture, appearing divine as they moved on their own accord. This sense of wonder and spectacle continued into the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Those automata on church organs I mentioned earlier did not just celebrate the divine mystery of life, but they could also be impish and provocative. These guys on the Strasbourg Cathedral organ would supposedly giggle and interrupt the service. Likewise, the wealthy populated their estates with Marist automata fountains, like these I got to see at Halbrun Palace in Austria. These mechanisms are playful, aiming to surprise. I've noticed a modern reincarnation of this act with these so-called useless boxes that turn themselves off. In a similar vein, we laugh at the android Data's curious attempts at emotion in Star Trek. In the European Enlightenment, automata took on a scientific role. Earlier, I mentioned that automata at this time were seen as proof that life was nothing but a mechanism. But the picture is actually more complex, because these restless machines could also be testaments to a divine or vital animating force, proponents of such theories argued. In another instance of these creations influencing how we think, Rousseau criticized civilized society as merely a collection of automata programmed to perform. But as the materialist French Revolution turned from terrific to terror, these living machines embodied a more anxious view of technology and humanity. Think of Frankenstein's monster. Historian Minsu Kang has described automata as liminal objects appearing between life and death, natural and supernatural, even free and enslaved. It is this quality that makes the various perceptions of them by different peoples and times interesting. In one of the earliest examples of automata in literature, Socrates refers to ones made by the mythical Daedalus as slaves which might run away and escape if no one ties them down. From the very beginning, then, automata were liminal. Machines like this, then, have a deep history. They were never just a fad. On the contrary, they influenced the way people saw themselves and the world around them. I've discussed just a couple of viewpoints, and certainly have not fully traced how this technology changed over time. I think often history does a disservice to the past by focusing on just one strand of the story. That being said, the strand which I've highlighted in my machine is this connection between automata and computers. When I turn this dial, switching between the pinwheel mechanism and the computer, I'm also switching from past to present. And while honestly the story of the computer is full of many threads and contingencies, what makes this connection important, in my opinion, is the shared language. Both the mechanical pinwheel and the digital pinwheel speak in binary. But there's a little paradox here, because the machine as a whole is not so black and white. As we've seen, people view automata both as wonderful and scary, natural and magical. I think there is still an ambivalence over automata, only now we call them robots, or artificial intelligence. In pop culture, we're drawn to both Data and the board, C-3PO and the Terminator. 
We wonder if robots will steal our jobs or free us from manual labor. Will AI solve all our problems, or is the singularity going to control us? Perhaps Socrates was right, and these automata will escape if we're not careful.